been that were ongoing in the early 2000s. This not only has contributed to improvement in the water quality, but it's also contributed to neighborhood beautification by incorporating in more native plantings. People are able to see that and there is some benefit for native pollinator habitat and also just maintaining natural ecosystems here. Um, but I feel that the city should be also continuing to work with the other watershed districts within the area, such as the Washington County and Ramsey Metro, and making sure that there's consistency spread around the area because we are all part of one area, wondering if it goes the same direction. Thank you. And your last question is what two environmental issues do you feel the ENR Commission should address for the city of Maplewood? I feel the city can never do too much to address water quality within the area. This is an area, you know, we're in a part of the city that has a lot of people, high density, everybody's here, we and using water and everything within this geographic region of Minnesota, we're at the top of a very, very large watershed. So we want to make sure that everything that we're sending downstream throughout the Mississippi is clean. And so just continually looking for projects to improve that water. And one way we can do it is by seeking out alternatives to road salt. Um, I mentioned that I lived up in Alaska for many years and nobody up there uses road salt. Um, so it can be done in a cold climate and there are ways, just looking for different ways to help maintain road safety without having to salt nearly as much. Um, but then another issue that I feel the city of Maple can improve upon is coordinating with local businesses to provide incentives to reduce the amount of single use plastic that they are putting out there. So you know, we're in a society, we're in, living in an age where takeout food is very, very common. And you don't, every time you order Thai food, you don't need a new set of plastic cutlery. So we're coordinating with businesses to provide some sort of incentive so they can have a behavior change to reduce the single use plastic that is going into our waste stream. Thank you very much. That concludes all of our questions. Council members will rank all of the candidates and submit their scores by the end of this week. And then the uh, results will be announced at our next council meeting, uh, which is on April 26th. So thank you very much, Ms. Bryan, for your participation and your interest in both commissions. Uh, and well, thank council you very much for the opportunity. I, I, this was, I think this would be a good experience for me. Thank you. Uh, and with that, council members, we have nothing else on our agenda. We have concluded our business for the workshop and we will adjourn. It is now 7.02. Why don't we take five minutes and we will reconvene at 7.07. .07. All right, we're adjourned.
Welcome to the Monday, April 12th, Maplewood City Council meeting. Tonight, I have asked Chief Nadeau to present to the council uh, in light of the tragedy that has occurred in Brooklyn Center. Uh, Chief Nadeau, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to talk to uh, everyone about what we're doing, what's happening, and uh, please comment on the governor's curfew. Uh, I'm sure all of you have received uh, notices on your cell phone uh, concerning the curfew that uh, went into effect at seven o'clock tonight. Uh, Chief Nadeau. Thank you and good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. As you know, after the death of George Floyd last May and the resulting unrest, there's been a great deal of planning and interagency cooperation that has gone into making sure that those in Minnesota are safe and can exercise their First Amendment rights to protest. For months, regional and state partners, along with the cities, including Maplewood, have been involved in Operation Safety Net, which includes four phases, each having its own mobilization and safety plan. Until yesterday, Sunday, April 11th, Operation Safety Net was in phase two with planned increases in staffing for police and partnering entities, including the National Guard, in full effect. As we know, yesterday, there was an extremely tragic shooting of a young man, Dante Wright, by a police officer in the city of Brooklyn Center. Let me take this opportunity to express on behalf of Maplewood Public Safety, my sincere condolences to Dante Wright. Obviously, this is a, a tragedy in our community and already on the heels of uh, so many that are suffering uh, because of the death of George Floyd. In Brooklyn Center, it started as a peaceful protest. There was also violence and looting which occurred, which necessitated the mobilization of numerous police and National Guard resources. Although Maplewood saw only one business damaged, other cities saw much more destruction, looting and rioting. Today, the Commissioner of Public Safety, John Harrington, and regional law enforcement leaders made the decision to move to phase three of Operation Safety Net, which significantly increases law enforcement resources across the region. In Maplewood, it does not drastically alter any of our plans, training, and preparations that we have prepared for. It merely accelerates the planned step to phase three by one week. Maplewood has worked very hard to identify retail targets, train our staff in areas such as crowd control and First Amendment protests, and we worked with our business partners to prepare them for possible unrest. Beginning last night, we have significantly increased staffing, canceled staff vacations and will deploy our resources in a way that protects the public, including those who wish to peacefully protest while ensuring the safety of our residents and our business community. As most know, there's been a curfew enacted by the governor of Minnesota, which affects Hennepin, Ramsey, and Anoka counties from 7 p.m. tonight, so it's now in effect, until 6 a.m. tomorrow, and law enforcement agencies throughout the region will be monitoring for problems. Information on the curfew can be found on our public safety media channels. There are some exceptions uh, for essential workers and also for religious observances, which I think is important to point out since tonight is the first night of Ramadan. Mayor and members of the city council, these events are often unpredictable and they can unfold quickly. You can be assured that the members of the Maplewood Police Department are prepared to react quickly to safeguard our citizens and our community. I encourage anyone that has concerns to call our police department through our police dispatch and ask to speak with an officer. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief, for those affirming words during this challenging time. Uh, at this point, uh, let's do the Pledge of Allegiance and begin our business meeting. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. City Clerk Sint, would you please uh, conduct the roll call for us? Yes. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. 
Here. Council Member Cave. Here. Council Member Juniman. Here. Council Member Knutson. Here. Mayor Abrams. Here. Thank you very much. Council members, we need to approve our agenda before we get started. Is there a motion? I move approval of the agenda. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved by Knutson, seconded by Cave. The motion to approve the agenda. Is there any further discussion or additions to the agenda? Mayor? Council member Juniman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, city cleanup this Saturday. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will add the mall update. Uh, and I'm going to also add the mayor's meeting with Congresswoman McCollum. I'm also going to add the public hearing for the lamplighter. And also I am going to add uh, a high V update to our agenda tonight. So council members, we have a very full agenda. Is there anyone else that would like to add anything? Okay, hearing none, then let's go forward with uh, our vote on the agenda. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Yes. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Moving on to the approval of the minutes for the March 22nd City Council Workshop meeting minutes. Is there a motion? I move approval. Second. Second. Moved by <laughs> Juniman, seconded by, hmm. I heard Knutson first, the motion to approve the March 22nd, 2021 City Council Workshop meeting minutes. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's move to a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knutson. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The next item is approval of the minutes for the March 22nd City Council meeting minutes. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to approve March 22nd minutes. Thank Second. you. Moved by Villa Vicencio, seconded by Juniman. The motion to approve the March 22nd City Council meeting minutes. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's move to a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Moving on, City Manager Coleman, the council calendar update. Uh, thank you, Mayor, members of the City Council. The calendar update is just to give you a snapshot of things that are coming up on our next agendas. Um, Council Member uh, Juniman also already mentioned the spring cleanup this Saturday from eight to one at Aldridge Arena. Um, on April 24th, this didn't make it on the report, but um, we will do the commission appointments based on the interviews and scoring uh, from this evening. And we will have an EDA meeting to review two uh, letters of intent for our property on London Lane. And we'll have that prior to the city council meeting on um, April 24th. On May 10th, we're going to hear from our multicultural advisory committee, um, giving you a report on the things that they have been working on. And also our internal team, our MORE team, will also give a status report. And on May 24th, our workshop, we think we're going to have a discussion on the ponds of Battle Creek. Um, that development review and um, look start looking for some decisions and recommendations from the council on that. And I will be working with Jeff Thompson to get you more information uh, prior to those meetings so you're aware of what's going to be expected. And with that, I don't have anything else unless council uh, members have topics of concern or interest that they would like staff to research for them. Thank you, City Manager Coleman. I just want a point of correction. The next council meeting is April 26th, not the 24th. Thank you. Okay. We aren't gonna be meeting on Saturday. So council members, is there anything else that you would like to add to this for discussion? Council member Villa Vicencio. None, thank you. Sorry about that. That's okay. Council member Cave. 
Not at this time. Councilmember Juniman. No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. No, thank you. Okay, then let's move to council presentations. Councilmember Juniman, do you want to talk about the city cleanup? Yes, Mayor. Um, after a, a rather odd year last year, everything was off. We are back on for spring cleanup this coming Saturday, April 17th. Back as always at Aldridge Arena from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. Um, fees vary from $10 for a car or SUV to up to $40 for a big trailer. Um, we have, as always, has household hazardous waste is free and shredding is free. And uh, for items accepted and so on, you can go to the city website or the most recent um, edition of the Maplewood Living on page five has everything you need to know about the city cleanup. And uh, as we have done, I think the last four years now, there will be a food and cash drive for the American Community Services and food shelves. So um, this Saturday, we're hoping for great weather and we're asking people to observe um, COVID-19 appropriate protocols, including masks and staying in your car as much as possible. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much for that. And council members, I would like to invite you all to uh, join me in serving as a greeter uh, and really directing traffic. Uh, I have done it for a number of years and it really is a great event to get out and uh, you know to see residents and to see what a successful event this is. And I know after having missed last year's, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things that people have been clearing out of their basements and out of their garages, and they can't wait to get this thing, uh, uh, get these things out of their, their homes. So looking forward to that. Thank you, Councilmember Juniman. Uh, okay. I wanted to uh, um, bring up a, an update on the mall. Uh, Councilmember Cave had uh, asked about the mall at our, what's happening at the mall. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to give you all an update. I met with uh, Paula Mueller, who is the manager of the mall, Chief Nadeau, Sergeant Steiner, and an officer from Metro Transit, and a number of re representatives from Washington Prime. Washington Prime is the, they're the owners of Maplewood Mall. The purpose of our meeting was to discuss uh, our partnership concerning mall security and a recent rise in juvenile delinquency issues at the mall. I can tell you before the meeting, I was very impressed with the research that was presented by our staff on other Metro malls and the problems that they're having. I can assure you that uh, the issues that had been, that we had observed at Maplewood Mall, we are not the only ones. Uh, these are similar issues to what other malls are experiencing. Uh, we discussed solutions. Uh, some of those include extra enforcement, additional training of mall security. And I can tell you that the mall implemented a new juvenile policy for Friday and Saturday nights. Now juveniles under this policy are not allowed to congregate in groups of more than four individuals together. Uh, ex the extra efforts that have been implemented in this partnership between our public safety department and the mall has resulted in positive results. Uh, there's been a drastic reduction in juvenile issues and there's been an increase in mall patrons, particularly in families. Uh, uh, one thing that uh, Ms. Mueller talked about was encouraging everyone to check out the mall website for the latest news and events that are happening at the mall. And one of the things that she previewed for us is that the state fair food trucks we'll be back at the mall in the parking lot uh, sometime uh, early this, well, in spring or early summer. So that was really, I think, a very productive meeting and a very positive meeting as to some of the changes that have been implemented at the mall. And I'm looking forward to what's uh, what we're gonna see there uh, into the future. Uh, another update on the mall, I attended a grand opening of a pop-up market at the mall called Bread. Uh, Bread is located at, in the lower level near Macy's at door four. Uh, what it is is a pop-up market. There were eight entrepreneurs. Uh, they offer a variety of retail sales. Uh, on weekends, I understand that there will be more entrepreneurs 
uh, selling clothes and shoes and a variety of different things. Uh, it was very encouraging to see, uh, you know, new fresh things happening at the mall. And uh, this particular uh, um, pop-up market was a very diverse market with uh, entrepreneurs uh, that uh, very diverse uh, um, mixture of, of entrepreneurs, which was really positive to see in our community. So that is the mall update. I also wanted to let you know that I had a meeting with um, Congresswoman McCullum. She regularly holds a, a, a meeting, a regional meeting of mayors, and she brought up uh, a number of things uh, that we needed to know about, uh, including uh, this new, um, the American Rescue Plan. She talked with the mayors about the new proposed infrastructure plan that uh, the Biden administration is putting together. And she gave us a little highlight and alerted us that she believes that there is a jobs bill that is going to be coming soon as part of the recovery program uh, trying to bring the, the economy and everyone out of this pandemic. Uh, it was a very productive meeting uh, with uh, Congresswoman McCollum, and I certainly appreciate everything that she's doing for us in Washington. Uh, since our last meeting, council members, another thing that I wanted to let you know about is there was a uh, public hearing that was convened by the St. Paul City Council concerning the Lamplighter Lounge located at Rice and Larpenter. And uh, there were a number of speakers during this public hearing. Uh, the public hearing preceded the, the deliberations of the St. Paul City Council concerning the liquor license of the Lamplighter. I spoke during that public hearing and shared information on Maplewood's concerns about the drunk drivers, the violence and the disorder that stems from the lamplighter and its impact on Maplewood. And uh, our public safety department uh, provided uh, information concerning the number of times that we have assisted St. Paul uh, and you know Roseville has been involved with some of that as well at that location because it has been a troubled spot. And so that was a, I think a very effective public hearing uh, concerning the lamplighter. And the, Last item that I wanted to touch upon during council presentations is the, uh, you know, it's been pretty exciting driving by and checking out all of the building progress at our new high V over on White Bear Avenue near Highway 36 in the old Rainbow Building. Uh, the high V store has announced their grand opening will be June 8th. And I know there are a lot of people that are excited about that, including myself. Uh, they are currently hiring a lot of a whole variety of full-time jobs with benefits. Uh, the uh, city has posted links. Uh, we've been asked to post links to these jobs. Uh, once the full-time uh, positions are filled, they will be posting and filling a variety of part-time jobs. So if any of you know anyone who is looking for work, uh, Hy-Vee is currently hiring. Uh, they can go to the Hy-Vee website and search out uh, the Maplewood store for a listing of all of the jobs. And as I said, right now, the full-time jobs are posted. The part-time jobs will be posted in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I am pleased to say that I am meeting with the new Hy-Vee manager on Thursday of this week. And uh, hopefully I'm gonna get a little sneak peek inside the building and all the construction that's going on. Uh, as you know, the liquor store, the Hy-Vee liquor store is already open as is the convenience store that is located out in the parking lot. So those really are my announcements. Uh, there's been a lot of things going on uh, and uh, I'm happy to bring them to you. And uh, uh, so with that, let's move on. The next agenda item we have is the Arbor Day Proclamation. Uh, Ms. Robbins, you are going to be the presenter for that. 
Thank you, Mayor. Members of the council, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Okay, thanks. Great. Um, I'm here tonight uh, to talk about Arbor Day, which is nat nationally observed throughout the United States and the world as a day to celebrate trees. And tonight we are asking the city council to proclaim, proclaim May 1st, 2021 as Arbor Day in Maplewood. And a little background on that is the national day is um, in, on April, um, the last Friday of April, but each state and community varies the date to coincide with planting times in their region. And in Minnesota, the month of May is typically designated as Arbor Month. And Minnesota communities observe Arbor Day usually scheduling celebrations in late April or May. Due to COVID, again this year, we didn't feel it was wise to schedule a large celebration, uh, but even without the formal celebration, we think Arbor Day should still be acknowledged and celebrated in the city of Maplewood. So we are asking the council tonight to consider proclaiming Saturday, May 1st as Arbor Day in Maplewood. And for two reasons, one, an Arbor Day proclamation supports the city's sustainability initiatives, encouraging residents to value plant and care for trees. And it's also one of the requirements for being designated a Tree City USA. And Maplewood has been designated a Tree City each year since 2011 and will continue this going forward annually. So with that, I will um, ask the council to consider this proclamation. Thank you very much. And I think May 1st goes along very well with our city tree sale. Oh, uh, okay. I think, yeah, the next week people will be picking up their trees that they already pre-ordered and paid for. Uh, so it, it all kind of fits in. Thank you for that report. Let's see if there are any questions from the council. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. No questions. Thank you. Councilmember Cave. Councilmember Juniman. No um, questions. No question. No. Oh, no. Go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry, no questions. I was on mute. Okay. You probably um, sounded pretty good while you were on mute. <laughs> <laughs> no, no questions, Mayor, but I certainly encourage people to continue to um, value trees in this city. As you have brought up several times, we have the emerald ash borer that we are, we are dealing with, and so we are encouraging people to replace those trees as they are able. And if you are part of a road project and trees are planted, please take care of them. Um, they do a lot for our community, not the least of which is reducing erosion and providing shade and um, helping to clean the air. And some people even say, I hear from people saying, and don't forget to mention wildlife habitat. So I just mentioned it. So please continue to honor the fact that we are a tree city and place value on your trees. Thank, Thank you. you. Council Member Knudsen. No questions. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, then do we have a motion concerning making May 1st Arbor Day? I move approval of the proclamation making May 1st Arbor Day in Maplewood in 2021. I'll second. second. I, okay, motion by Juniman, seconded. I heard cave first. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none. Then let's go to a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Okay, going on to the next agenda item. It's the 2020 Community Development Department Annual Report. Presenter, we have uh, Mr. Thompson is going to kick it off tonight. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Can you uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, and we can see your PowerPoint. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, we are bringing to you uh, this evening um, the 2020 Community Development Report. As the, as the Council uh, knows, the Community Development Department oversees and manages and guides the, the uh, economic growth and community investment uh, within Maplewood. So we do have uh, tonight for the, the chairs from each of the four boards and commissions um, that are within community development. And so in a bit, I will turn it over to them to highlight uh, the work of each of those uh, individual boards and commissions in 2020. But before I do that, I just wanted to highlight 
uh, four items for the council um, to give to give you just a bigger picture uh, uh, outline of some of the accomplishments um, and work within community development uh, in 2020. So the first uh, update was in, in terms of the physical investment, it was a very strong year for uh, construction in Maplewood. Last year, there was almost uh, just under $162 million um, in construction value built throughout the community. And that's in a, a, a number of projects. So that was led by um, the High V project um, that the mayor mentioned um, already. Significant investments in the um, schools in Maplewood, uh, the three uh, significant, either new or significant expansions of uh, John Glenn, the new Allen Page Elementary School, as well as Carver Elementary School. And then there's also continued investment and in construction within the 3M corporate uh, campus, as well as um, St. John's Hospital um, in the north side of Maplewood. So that's kind of the first highlight is, is despite the pandemic and, and changes um, in the economy, it was a very strong year um, in construction. In fact, uh, higher in 2020 than the past several years. So a uh, very good sign for the, the investment economic growth in, in Maplewood. This, the second item I wanted to highlight is some of the efforts um, in our planning work uh, for future growth in Maplewood. And there are really two projects in this, in this category. First is the, the 2040 comprehensive plan uh, was adopted shortly before 2020. And we have continued uh, or started on the implementation of that plan uh, to ensure <coughs> that that 20 year growth within Maplewood um, has a, a roadmap and a plan for being implemented uh, in the near term, but also in the long term. And then the second significant planning project uh, last year was uh, the South Maplewood Century Avenue redevelopment. Um, this is really associated with the ponds at Battle Creek, as well as the, the land adjacent to the correctional facility. We uh, partnered with uh, Perkins and Will, uh, sorry, we partnered with Ramsey County uh, and hired in Perkins and Will um, to uh, really do a robust community engagement process to, to look at and consider the future uses of both of those properties that are currently owned by the county um, to guide not only the county's decision as landowner and operator of the golf course, but also uh, the really the city's uh, role in uh, determining kind of the land use and zoning on those properties moving forward. And then the third item um, I wanted to highlight as an accomplishment from last year is our rental licensing and code enforcement program. Um, last year, 2020, we did uh, launch the rental licensing program and we are now uh, licensing all uh, around 80 uh, multifamily properties in Maplewood and um, ensuring they're complying with our public safety requirements around best practices for, for tenant and property management, but also with the physical, um, uh, the physical status or the physical investment in those properties with routine and ongoing inspections to ensure they're meeting our current housing requirements and housing codes. So that uh, was launched last year and we continue to implement it here in 2021 uh, with uh, our single family uh, properties in Maplewood. And the fourth and final thing I wanted to highlight for community development is, is really our, our public health uh, work that um, uh, really Molly Wellens, our environmental health officer did. You know, typically this is work that, that is kind of ingrained in our other construction or other um, projects in Corian Maplewood, but this really, really represents one of the significant uh, changes that we made was as a result of the pandemic, our, what is kind of our more uh, ongoing and, and, and uh, routine inspections around restaurants and public health really uh, focused on uh, engaging our restaurant and food service community to uh, adapt to the ever-changing government uh, governor's uh, executive orders on uh, capacity, but also providing them with uh, resources in terms of masks and guidance on the COVID pre uh, preparedness plans, but also um, implementing a lot of the flexibility that the council granted over um, outdoor patios, um, signage, other things that the council granted flexibility to ensure our restaurants in the community were able to successfully and safely operate during the pandemic. So uh, the, the report is more comprehensive and goes into a lot more detail. Um, just to, to keep it concise, I just wanted to highlight those four items as kind of the, the, the headlines for community development. And then Mayor certainly wanted to turn it over to the, the chairs that are with us this evening to talk about the works of, of those individual boards and commissions. Thank you much, Mr. Thompson. Uh, let's see if staff have any questions of you and then we will go on to 
Uh, this order, Mr. Kempe, Ms. Palzer, Mr. Jenkins, and Mr. Arbuckle in that order. Uh, so any questions for Mr. Thompson, Councilmember Villavicencio? None right now. Councilmember Cave? No questions. Councilmember Juniman? No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen? No, thank you. Okay, then let's hear from Mr. Kempe, uh, the Chair of the Community Design Review Board. Hey, um, good evening, um, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, I've been asked to give a few words about the year that wasn't. Um, <laughs> so uh, in this past year, we've uh, not had any meetings in person, of course. We've been able to conduct our business using Zoom. We've still been able to go out and, uh, and view the projects uh, for our own information. Um, and we've, been, we've uh, approved a few, some multiple education projects, including a new elementary school. Um, there's also a new multifamily apartment project, <coughs> excuse me, near County Road C and Highway 61. We have reviewed design for the new Heidi grocery store, convenience store, and liquor store that we've uh, all been talking about. Um, other significant projects include um, a new Menard store, a new hotel, and a new fast food restaurant. Also, we have reviewed uh, comprehensive sign plans for uh, 3M and St. John's. And that's all I've got to say. Mr. Kempe, I can say the Community Design Review had a very busy year. Uh, let's uh, go to uh, Ms. Palzer with Environmental and Natural Resources. And then we'll ask, we'll come back around with questions if the council has any questions. So Ms. Palzer. Hello, good evening, mayor and council members. Glad to be here tonight. Um, so I just have recently taken over uh, the chair position. I wanna thank Commissioner Miller for, for holding that down in 2020. And we also have two new members to our commission uh, as of last fall. So excited about that. Um, within the report, there's a few things um, you know, to highlight here as far as kind of five main things that we worked on last year. Um, the solid waste management ordinance was kind of one of the first things that we tackled. We needed to do that uh, update so that it matched with our contracts for our trash hauling and recycling as well. The main change uh, there being that multifamily properties are now required to be in our city recycling program. And that's going to really help, I think, with our reporting, uh, education, uh, outreach, and, and things like that to get some better uh, participation, hopefully, and uh, making sure that we have everything that's in the recycling belongs in the recycling and not a lot of cross-contamination um, as far as that goes. We also had started work on the Mississippi River corridor, corridor critical area, um, and that's something that we're continuing to work on. Uh, the state updated their rules, and so we need to make sure that our ordinance matches up with those rules. So that's something that we've been reviewing over the last couple of months, and we'll continue to do that here soon. We also took a look at the <clears throat> city's purchasing policy as part of the sustainable practices, uh, part of our uh, kind of purview. Uh, we recommended some changes to the policy, including um, adding a social equity purchasing uh, wording and, and, and directive there. And then uh, also regarding climate friendly local foods. Um, and then as far as city purchases, recommending the purchase of electric or hybrid vehicles, unless there's a specific reason why that can't happen. Environmental education is one main, uh, you know, very important thing that our commission um, kind of likes to partner with other agencies on and specifically the Maplewood Nature Center. Uh, we know that uh, there's been a lot of changes there. Um, really happy. I know that the task force put in a ton of work uh, kind of looking at a lot of different issues regarding that in hopes of reopening the Nature Center eventually. Um, our commission will continue to support uh, anything that uh, it, like participation in that task force, kind of the second phase of that, um, and then any environmental educations and en environmental education initiatives going forward from there. And then the last thing is the climate adaptation plan. Uh, we just reviewed the full draft report of that in early 2021. 
Uh, you as a, a council are going to see that May 10th, I believe. Um, there was a really nice article by council member Juniman in the Maplewood Living newsletter that just arrived in our homes as a, you know within the last week here. So there's some really good information about what that process was, um, how the information was gathered and how those recommendations and actions uh, for our climate adaptation um, were, were formed and then kind of our recommendations going forward. So really excited about that. There's a lot of work that went into that and really important work too, I think, as we move forward as a, as a city and community and kind of understanding uh, global warming and the impacts that uh, result from that. Thank you, Ms. Pulzer. Ne next, we have Mr. Jenkins with our Housing and Economic Development Commission. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. It's nice to be in front of you, sort of, again. Uh, the, obviously, the past year, and I actually wanna talk a little bit about the past year and a half have been different, but as our other commissions have talked about, they've continued to be successful. Um, we were very fortunate to spend a lot of time, um, in fact, two meetings, with um, the EDA, so all of yourselves, as well as our commission early in 2020 that I think set a good foundation for how 2020 finished and how 2021 is starting. Um, one of my favorite um, projects and components of uh, housing and economic development, um, I hats off and humongous thanks to the staff at the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce and to all of you and city staff for continuing um, our engagement with our business community. Uh, we continue to have great relations with our businesses, get great feedback and continue to give you and staff information to help us plan for the years ahead. Um, even when we have years like this that we never would have planned for. Uh, and lastly, I think the big thing I want to, well, actually two more things, sorry. Uh, the other item I do want to call out, we also continued to keep the uh, keep the momentum with the state of the city event and continuing to recognize those businesses in our community that really go that extra mile, whether it's environmental sustainability, such as pale blue, excuse me, pale blue dot, or the community contributions of Strauss um, skate and ski. Um, but lastly, uh, while we uh, resigned ourselves to Zoom meetings over this year, um, I just want to thank you, uh, Council for and staff, for everything you've done for us this past year and let you know uh, we've adapted. We can continue to uh, get together and support uh, the EDA and the economic development we know is going to increase and uh, and hopefully um, really start to kick into gear through the remainder of 2021. So um, council and staff, we're here and ready when you are to uh, kick this into overdrive and, and start this next year off right. Thank you, Mr. Jenkins. And our last chair with the Planning Commission, Mr. Arbuckle. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, Good evening, Mayor, Council members, staff members, and any other individuals that I don't see. Um, we were able to get in one meeting prior to the pandemic that happened, uh, but most of our meetings then took place on Zoom. Uh, we've all enjoyed doing that because uh, I think everybody feels a little bit more relaxed in being able to ask questions and, and continuing to uh, be more free about what they ask. Um, we uh, kept our projects moving forward and we could, uh, on the planning commission then we continued to work on implementing the city vision for the North End by developing a, a draft zoning district for the area, which will be considered by the city council for adoption later this year. The planning commission also worked on in 2020 uh, to complete revamping the city planning unit development ordinance and procedures. In 2020, we reviewed two variants 
request and 12 conditional use requests. Uh, the significant projects include the New Menards store, new hotel in the North End, Hy-Vee, and the new elementary. And I do appreciate the uh, city uh, council members and mayors uh, when we spend the time and do the reviews and have the, the open meetings on that, that they uh, really take to heart what we suggest to them, which is great that they consider our, our knowledge uh, a, a good uh, favor. And that's what I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Arbuckle. And I want to thank all four chairs of our commissions. The work that you do is so valuable to our community. You are advisors to the council and you are trusted advisors because we know that you put in the time and the effort uh, and you really come up with a great work product. It's, it's kind of fun to see that Maplewood uh, had so much uh, um, economic development and so many changes, uh, even though we were in the midst of a pandemic. I think I wrote down the number 162 million is what I heard Mr. Mr. Uh, Thompson say, but all of you have weighed in on so many important projects and you were able to continue the important work of our city. So thank you from me and from all of our residents. So I'm gonna open it up to the council to see if they have any questions or comments. Uh, council member Villa Vicencio. None at this time, thank you. Council member Cave. Um, just comment, no questions. I just wanna say these four groups, the enthusiasm that they've carried through this pandemic um, it's like they didn't even miss a beat. The city's able to continue to move forward with all of our projects because of the commissions and being on the council, the, you know, like you said, mayor, these commissions are so important because for us to make future decisions, all these commissions have to go through a process and the fact that they did not stall and everything was moving forward. Now we're coming out of the pandemic. It just, it looks like we didn't skip a beat from the council, but it's really from all the background with these commissions. So hats off everybody. Um, you guys are advisors and I rely on you heavily and you guys do such a great job. I, I can't even express in words what you do, but I am so grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Council member Juniman. Uh, thank you, mayor. No questions, but uh, again, repeating what my colleagues have said, uh, these people are invaluable and keeping to their noses to the grindstone, so to speak, during all of this upheaval of the last year is just incredible. And you see this written down in a, a report and you think, wow, this is all going on while the world is sort of in chaos. It's amazing. And I, I thank everybody and this, the longevity person here, I have to say for years and years and years, I have been relying on their very sage advice. And I think our community reflects that in all of our projects. We don't look like an old city. We don't look like a city that doesn't know how to move forward. And it's thanks to people like this that we are in the forefront. So my thanks to all of them. Councilmember Knudsen. I agree with everything said so far, uh, but I sit on, observe three of these commissions and uh, the active deliberation by the members and the talents that they bring to the table pretty much assures me that um, that, that when they come to the council with a recommendation stuff, it's really uh, heartfelt. And um, I think always we look for we look forward to hearing the commission or understanding what their decision was, and um, and support um, the vast majority of things they recommend. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And chairs of our commissions, I would ask that you please take our words of. Thanks and appreciation back to everyone on the commission for the that you represent for all of the work that they do and all the time that they spend uh, and their well thought out decision making. So thank you very much for that report. Uh, we really appreciate it. Moving on our agenda, we have a report from the Public Safety Department, their 2020 annual report. Chief Nadeau. 
Thank you, members of the city council and mayor. Can you see my screen as I have it up here? Yes, we can. Fantastic. So I know that we have a packed agenda tonight, and I appreciate the opportunity to share just a few moments of our 2020 public safety annual report with you. Uh, I'm just going to be hitting on some of the highlights. Uh, I would uh, say first and foremost that uh, this is a, a really great way for us as a public safety department to be able to be transparent with our public and talk about all of the things that we attempted to do and what some of the challenges were and some of the successes, quite frankly, that we had during the year. And I would invite any member of the public that may be interested in viewing this report that they can come into a uh, public safety and request a report, or it's easily accessible in PDF format through our website. Uh, for the uh, public safety department in the city. So again, um, it is the public safety annual report. Oh, it doesn't look like a one, so it's kind of here. Okay, here we go. Um, this is kind of what it looks like. Again, we have that on our, um, our main website. So I would start off by saying that 2020 was really a challenging year. Um, we had uh, COVID, which showed up in the spring, uh, and really, uh, I don't want to say that in public safety, we uh, kind of ground to a halt, but we really had to quickly figure out how to adjust to best practices to keep both the community safe and our public safety staff safe. Um, as you all know, that that adjusted very quickly, and while a lot of our residents uh, were sheltering at home, and while uh, many of our uh, businesses were closed, our police and fire were still obviously on the street and doing what they could. We did adjust some work schedules. Uh, we quickly got personal pr protective equipment. Uh, Chief Lucan and Chief Mondor did an absolutely fantastic job of getting us high quality PPE and making sure that everyone had an ample supply and obviously assisting residents and really helping to keep them safe during the pandemic were some of the big challenges that we uh, initially faced. We also had some challenges with uh, social unrest with the death of George Floyd. Um, obviously, that was something that created a great deal of trauma in our area, quite frankly, also in our country and even worldwide. Um, as we navigated 2020, uh, our police officers in particular um, uh, still continued our outreach activities, but obviously public attitudes about policing shifted Think that affected our ability to recruit and our ability to really outreach to the diverse communities that make up Maplewood. Uh, that combined with the pandemic did uh, kind of give us a one-two punch, but we adjusted as we could. We had some amount of public disorder and vandalism that occurred in Maplewood. I would say that of our uh, 54 officers at the time, we were able to put many officers uh, in excess of 35 officers on the street within several hours. And we were able to uh, essentially help safeguard some of our businesses in town, whether we're talking about Rice and Larpenter, whether we're talking about Best Buy, the mall itself. Um, there was several attempts that were made by groups that had targeted St. Paul and other suburbs. And we did see some property damage in Maplewood, but uh, through that week where there was uh, quite a bit of disorder and looting, in addition to obviously uh, protests that were that were uh, lawful and that uh, were important, um, we really did uh, do, a, I think, a very good job in that uh, part. Second uh, uh, part of the year, we did start to see increases in property crimes. Uh, specifically, uh, we're still dealing with some vehicle crime, uh, whether it's catalytic converter thefts, auto thefts, we also started to see some increases in garage burglaries. And so um, it was a challenging year in ways that we hadn't uh, probably seen in Maplewood in the past. What I'm really proud of is, is how our public safety staff really stepped up and adjusted to the challenge uh, posed by the pandemic and by some of the social unrest. We quickly adopted new protocols and our Departments both have their own strategic plan and really the strategic plan in both departments have really become ingrained in uh, our agencies and what we do day to day. So the city council has a strategic plan and we operate under that umbrella. Each department has its own strategic plan as public safety in Maplewood 
we work together and we try and find synergies and um, areas where we can work better together. But each department has its own unique mission as well. And we're very intentional about making sure that we have strategic plans that guide us and that have action steps and that are measurable and that are transparent that we publish out to the community. So really, um, when we looked at things like community outreach, um, after we kind of made those initial adjustments with the pandemic, um, we had to look at, okay, if, if community outreach and transparency are goals, if continued diversity, inclusive, inclusivity <laughs> goals are a priority, then how do we um, do that in the pandemic era? Um, so just getting back to our department specific strategic plans, um, we started really with taking input from staff. Uh, in the last couple of years, we've increasingly then gone to stakeholders. We've asked our elected officials, we've asked people from other city departments, and more and more we've gone out to some of our other strategic partners like the schools, uh, community groups, the faith community, our multicultural advisory committee, really making sure that these are not just the plans that we are creating by ourselves, thinking that we can accurately anticipate what our community wants, needs, or expects, but what are the things that, that our citizens really uh, would want us to be working on and are the things that we're planning to do in alignment with council priorities. So our multicultural advisory committee, uh, this was set to uh, kind of start last spring around April or May and obviously the pandemic um, affected that. We uh, were challenged with whether or not to start our MAC, our Multicultural Advisory Committee, uh, virtually, or if we wanted to be in person. You know, obviously, there was a preference for building relationships with the MAC members, uh, both with the police department and with each other. And uh, we initially kind of kicked that can down the road, hoping that we could do it in the first month or two. But after the events surrounding George Floyd happened, we were convinced that it was time to get going with our Multicultural Advisory Committee. So um, we started our uh, work. It was obviously uh, a continuation of some of the work that had been done uh, dating back to the Use of Force Task Force and then the Police Advisory Commission. Uh, right now we have 14 members. They uh, comprise a number of diverse backgrounds. We've got people from um, uh, our mosque. We have uh, different ethnicities and races that are represented. We have um, different um, genders. We have um, really people of of different ages that are a part of our MAC. And we really wanna make sure that the things that we're doing are um, again, um, culturally appropriate and really um, centered on how we can better connect and serve the residents of Maplewood. Uh, this week, uh, the MAC is hosting a forum on human trafficking. It'll be a virtual forum. Uh, our partners in this particular forum are the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and the Tubman Center who provides resources to um, the people that have been involved or affected by human trafficking. Uh, the mayor has been nice enough to uh, agree to do an opening for us. And so I think that's just one of the ways that even in a virtual environment, uh, even though we'd love to have our MAC members out there working more with community, we're trying to find more and even better ways to be able to utilize them in a way that um, helps to serve our community. The MAC has also been uh, involved in uh, policy, uh, advising us on policies. They uh, help to guide our strategic plan, and they've been involved in every one of our hiring and promotional processes that we've had since they were formed. So whether it's uh, brand new police officers coming in, um, they're a part of that uh, interview process and part of the scoring process, but also um, our more recent promotional processes, uh, we also want community voice included in that. We started this year with a grant from the United States Department of Justice, and uh, we uh, were able to secure that grant as a three-year grant, which uh, pays about 75% of the salary for a position that we're calling our community policing coordinator. This was actually a position that we had talked about for some time, and this uh, position, which is currently filled uh, really well by Emily Burt McGregor, is one that does a couple of different things. First, uh, she helps us to really focus on community outreach and helping to plan community events. And um, we're particularly focused on some of the communities that have been more traditionally difficult for police or public safety to reach. And she just does an excellent job of being able to build those relationships that are necessary to carry that out. 
The other thing that Emily has been doing is working with our apartment communities. About 20 to 25% of our uh, crime and calls for service and public safety come from our rental communities. Uh, so really part of her job is to work with managers and owners and residents to make sure that we've got uh, more effective problem solving and increased safety in some of our uh, rental communities. So it could be uh, some of our manufactured home communities. It could be some of our apartment communities, but every week she's going through calls. She's seeing where we're having issues and then making sure that again, we're working together to help problem solve those and really make sure that we've got great safe, um, you know, rental communities for our residents. So as we talk about community outreach, you know, again, one of the things that I'm really proud of from last year is that we didn't just say, well, you know, there's a pandemic and we really can't do it in the same way. We really looked for, for new ways to be able to do that. And so I think the council is aware that for the last two years, we've had a school-based big brother, big sister program where public safety staff and others from our community have been mentoring uh, children uh, at Weaver Elementary School. Uh, typically, they would take one hour of their week at their lunch break or something like that to go meet with that child and, um, you know, just kind of be that good, strong, stable, same-sex role model to that child. Uh, you know, obviously, with the pandemic and kids being at home, we worked really hard to make sure that we could solidify some of those connections virtually. Uh, quite frankly, it, it was challenging for a lot of our uh, big brother, big sister matches, but most were able to do at least some of it. So the picture on the left shows Lieutenant Crotty uh, with her little, who we've kind of blanked out there because we want to protect her privacy. The photo on the right is um, kind of at the start of the pandemic when we had uh, the people that we uh, termed our healthcare heroes at St. John's that were showing up for work every day, obviously putting themselves in harm's way uh, during a pandemic. And so we had a couple of events where we were able to honor them as public safety and uh, it was it was very clear to us that they appreciated that recognition and they've always been great partners to public safety in our community and we we're happy to do that. In addition to um, the things we've already talked about, you know, since we couldn't do these large gatherings that we're really getting used to, and quite frankly, starting to get good at, we looked for other ways. So one of the things that we did um, was the birthday parades. And so for children that were not able to, you know, have that traditional party where the grandparents or the friends or the neighbors or, or maybe even just their schoolmates came over, uh, they were just kind of at home. Um, we started to put together lists and we would have public safety visit um, these kids. Uh, I, I hope that you've seen at least some of the videos that we posted on our social media site, particularly our Facebook page about how excited all of these kids were. What you don't see is how excited all of our public safety staff were. They were just absolutely uh, excited to be able to be a part of these kids day and uh, make their day a little bit brighter during a pandemic. And then we did some small scale, what we call pop-up events where um, we could just do a, a small socially distance uh, uh, get togethers, mostly in some of our rental communities. So the picture on the right is some of our officers at, I think we called it a pop-up freezy pop event. So again, just trying to make some of those connections and make sure that we're doing everything that we can to build relationships with our community. We also had the Santa Parade, which was a hit. Um, Santa um, went through a lot of our apartment communities. Again, um, there's a lot of kids that weren't able to go to the mall or go to their favorite store to see Santa this year. So public safety decided that we were gonna bring Santa to them. Uh, I think our staff, again, probably enjoyed that one about as much as the kids did. And then the photograph on the right um, uh, shows that uh, during a pandemic when public safety staff and others in our city knew that our community had needs, um, I really think that they stepped up to the next level. So we did uh, clothing and coat drives. Um, there was backpack drives where we uh, fundraised, but also uh, got assistance from Maplewood Mall and others. Um, there was food distribution that took place. Uh, there was um, PPE distribution that took place. Um, again, really just doing what we can within those CDC guidelines to build a relationship and to find ways to serve our, our public during a really difficult time. In recruitment and hiring, uh, we continue to, in my opinion, absolutely raise the bar. The number of um, people that are applying for police officer jobs is diminishing. 
And so we have been on a, a big effort with our human resources department and some of our internal staff to go out to colleges, to go out to high schools, to go to different places where we think there might be great um, candidates and um, you know, make sure that they know what's going on in Maplewood. It's been our goal to make Maplewood a destination city for police and firefighter paramedics. And I think that we're well on that way. Um, we got uh, five new officers, two new CSOs last year, and we're continuing to look for, um, again, the best and brightest, and most qualified, but also looking to who are some of the non-traditional applicants that we might be able to find out there that maybe come from you know a different background or speak an additional language, or uh, you see Officer Cruz in the lower right-hand corner, Officer Cruz uh, came from uh, an environment where I believe she had about 15 years in social work both working for Regents Hospital and later being a co-responder with Minneapolis Police as an employee of Hennepin County as a, a social worker and a mental health worker. So really uh, getting that, that great diverse pool of applicants and doing everything that we can to make sure that they know about the amazing opportunities that continue to present themselves in Maplewood. We also um, had some success in our fire department. And this is something I'm really excited about. Um, in working with um, the fire chief, uh, Steve Lucan, and uh, our new fire chief and EMS chief, Mike Mondor, um, you know, when you look at the people that are coming out of classes for paramedicine and for um, firefighting, um, it's been uh, typically uh, white males who um, have come into the job interviews uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we recognize that to be in alignment with the city's uh, priorities, about diversity and inclusion that we needed to step up. And so we were in the second year of their new cadet program. Uh, so the cadet program uh, brings them on uh, and gives them the experience typically while they're going to school. Uh, the uh, cadets work, I think, up to 14 hours a week. We don't want them to come on full time. We want them to focus on their studies. Uh, and we got two really great recruits last year uh, from uh, their cadet program, and we're in the process of hiring some more people that we really think are going to hold promise to being the future of, of Maplewood Fire. So um, the cadet program uh, in fire, which in some ways uh, kind of mimics some of the success that we've had in our community service officer program in the police department, is off to a great start, and uh, I think everyone's really excited about it. Of course, one of the biggest events, maybe the biggest event outside of the pandemic and some of the outrest, uh, Last year was Steve Lucan retiring after 43 years. Um, Steve uh, was such a part of um, the things that have happened to Maplewood Fire from uh, his service as a paid on call firefighter to his service as a chief of a um, paid on call and full time and then part time and full time and then eventually that full time fire department. Um, you know, he's really woven into the DNA of what Maplewood Fire looks like. Uh, quite frankly, I don't think that you could find a more dedicated public servant than Steve Lucan, and we've talked at great length about Steve. Uh, we are very fortunate that during the transition, uh, we um, have been able to bring uh, Chief Lucan back on a part-time basis um, as we continue to do things like build internal capacity for fire inspections. We have three of our uh, current full-time firefighters that are completing their coursework and getting that hands-on experience with Chief Lucan on inspections. And so where that had been a contract relationship for a number of years, and we kind of had to have uh, community development and others kind of wait for our contractors to come in uh, with Chief Lucan's experience in about another 18 months to two years, we'll have uh, a couple of people ready to go and uh, develop that capacity. So we're happy to have Chief Lucan back, even if it's only part-time. Last year, we received the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce Award for outreach and um, our commitment and success in hiring uh, people from uh, uh, you know, diverse backgrounds. And so that's something that we were really uh, excited about. I'm very glad that some of our staff has worked really hard on uh, making sure that we're getting the best applicants and, and really taking outreach and relationship building to the next level, we're able to achieve that level of recognition. We certainly appreciate that. Last year, we um, continued to make an effort to recognize our public safety staff. Uh, we had multiple awards for life-saving medical response. 
I know that we typically have brought those to the council and those are uh, some of the best nights that we have in public safety to, to be able to present those to you. Obviously in the COVID environment, that's been a little uh, different. We've also had instances of peacefully resolving very dangerous calls to include calls with weapons and really just excellence in training and work performance. Um, and so uh, again, that is really one of our priorities is uh, making sure that we're paying attention and really recognizing our folks that are doing such a good job. So mental health outreach continued to evolve. Our MHOT team, our mental health outreach team, uh, as a reminder, is uh, about a three-year-old program and it uh, involves our community paramedics from the fire department work, working with specially trained police officers. Um, this is um, something that we recognize a need for uh, about two years ago and really started to work on. Um, I know that the council is well, well aware of the fact that we've had to overcome a number of hurdles, whether it was um, having to declare uh, ourselves a HIPAA hybrid entity so that police and fire could share records, um, figuring out how to screen in people uh, from our community that you know repeatedly use 9-11 or who need um, additional supports. Uh, Obviously, in uh, this past year, we saw a lot of unsheltered uh, and homeless individuals, and so trying to help them, many of them obviously um, having um, you know, issues around um, uh, chemical addiction or uh, mental health. Um, so um, I'm excited to let the council know that our embedded social worker, uh, Amy, has started uh, from Ramsey County. She started last week. Um, this is something that was over a year in the making and really the culmination of us really looking at where we were having some success with our mental health outreach team and where we had gaps. And um, we are the first suburb in Ramsey County to have an embedded social worker. And I can tell you, she's already started to do things that we didn't even probably realize. She was, for an example, on a call with Officer Bergeron the other day, uh, kind of right rang along and and there was a issue of um, some child neglect and endangerment. And um, she started making phone calls and uh, accessing a lot of the resources that she had available at her fingertips. And I think that all of us in the police department and the fire department are convinced that we probably never even fully appreciated all of the tools that she was going to be able to bring to help us in Maplewood to help the people in our community that are oftentimes the most vulnerable. So. Uh, I'd be remiss to not mention how much uh, the mayor had helped us uh, working with Ramsey County and the county commissioners and uh, attending uh, a number of meetings with, uh, uh, you know, the county social work team over there. And um, it's off to a great start. And really, um, this is something that I think our whole community should be excited about. So for uh, 2020, it was the second year of our auto theft and theft from auto grant. So again, this is a fully funded uh, position from the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Uh, there's a small fee that's attached to every auto insurance policy in uh, Minnesota that helps to fund this position. Um, tonight, later, uh, the council will be uh, uh, voting on something in their con uh, consent agenda where uh, the state through St. Paul is going to be giving us another $50,000 for equipment. Um, that is a direct result of this partnership that we have with Commerce. And quite frankly, they're using the work that Maplewood and Glenn are doing as an example for other communities. And so to have a position like this fully funded and to have some of these additional opportunities for funding um, I think really just speaks to the fact that, you know, we're doing everything that we can to make sure that people that steal cars or steal things from cars are held accountable. So hats off to uh, Officer McCarty for doing such a great job. Uh, a 12 percent increase in charging probably doesn't sound like a lot. But, um, you know, if you think about how many cars are stolen and the physical evidence that is there, we are literally swabbing every recovered stolen car for DNA having those results tested by the BCA, then getting suspect information and charging people at a rate that I think really um, shows our commitment to making sure that our residents um, and their property are safeguarded. 2020, we um, continued to prioritize physical wellness for public safety staff. 
uh, that has been um, something that we understand is important, particularly since they have jobs where they might be driving for three hours and they have to get out and, and really physically perform some sort of a function. But where I would say that we made our most progress last year was um, really trying to get um, out in front of employee mental uh, wellness and education. So we um, examined uh, best practices, what other cities were doing, and um, added uh, additional mental health check-ins for our police officers and firefighters, knowing that first responders um, are exposed to traumatic events at a rate that is, um, you know, many, many times the average person. Uh, we are bringing in educators to talk about uh, things like resiliency and um, how to alleviate stress. Uh, we are using diffusings and debriefings when um, our staff are uh, exposed to traumatic uh, events such as the death of a child. Um, uh, the combination of the resources that we're putting into this, the time and energy that we're putting into this, I think has really been one of the things that helps uh, us as, as a team in Maplewood uh, to attract and retain uh, good, healthy first responders. And so the city has its own fitness and wellness initiatives. And this is in addition to that, um, but for uh, a relatively low cost, um, we're doing a much better job at understanding and responding to the mental health of our first responders, which, as you might imagine, uh, is really critical. So we've had our community information report for the last couple of years. We actually used to have two different reports. We had one that talked about our use of force, and then we had a different report with demographics of people that we arrested and um, uh, people that we had contact with, people that we pulled over. Uh, last year, 2019, was the first year that we combined those in something we called our community information report. So we continue to really look for um, how can we get to that next level with transparency. We want to make sure that our public understands who we are, what we seek to do, the results that we've had, and um, that all of those um, the, that data is um, placed into context. And, and the phrase I like to put uh, on it is, you know, I just want, I want to put it out there in Front Street. Um, you know, there's uh, people that have concerns about police uh, action, and I want to make sure that our public understands who we are and what we're doing. This last year, the, um, the thing that we added to it was um, the internal investigations. So every uh, internal investigation uh, that was done last year in the police department uh, was summarized um, in a way that was respectful to the employees, but also um, lets our public know the types of um, issues that we investigate and what the end result was. Again, we're continuing to try and seek that next level of transparency and let our public know who we are. We're all excited about our new North Fire Station. Um, uh, Chief Mondor will be um, presenting on that tonight. Uh, 2020 represented several milestones that we achieved. Uh, with the architect and the construction manager being uh, hired and really um, walking through all of the different elements in uh, fire stations from an employee health and wellness perspective. So uh, I know that you've probably heard about hot zones, which are zones that might have carcinogens, uh, warm zones, which are transition zones, and then the areas where they, where they live and, and where they, um, where they work and where they um, eat. So, um, a lot of work uh, was done in that respect. So um, that is my abbreviated version of the um, 2020 annual report. I'd certainly be willing to entertain any questions from council, but as a reminder for anyone that lives in the city that might be listening, this report is available online uh, in its entirety. Uh, our communications department, I think, does a great job of not only laying this out uh, as far as information, but uh, putting it together in a way that um, you know shows uh, uh, who our staff is, the people that we hired, pictures of the different things we're involved in. And so I would encourage any member of our community to, um, to check that out. And of course, if they've got any comments, feedback, or concerns to contact me or somebody in the public safety department. Thank you, Mayor. 
Thank you, Chief, for that comprehensive report. It really is quite amazing uh, what uh, you were able to accomplish uh, during a global pandemic. Uh, quite amazing. I also want to uh, just reiterate and invite my fellow council members to the MAC Human Trafficking Zoom event. Uh, it is going to be next week. Uh, I believe, is it the... Uh, do you know the date on it, Chief? It's on my calendar. I it's on the 14th. Uh, Wednesday, the 14th at 6 o'clock. Uh, it is going to be, I think, a very informative uh, um, and very important discussion for our community to have. So please join us for that. Uh, I'm going to open it up for council members for questions uh, or comments. Council Member Villa Vicencio. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chief, for the um, thorough presentation. Uh, my one question for today is uh, the Federal Community Policing Coordinator Grant, is there a pathway um, after the three years are over to continue that position? Thank you for that question, uh, Council Member Villa Vicencio. It, uh, we, um, it is a three-year grant, um, and there is a... Um, uh, there is a requirement that we keep the position for a fourth year. That was kind of written in as part of the grant. So if we wanted to extend it after uh, the, the four years, we would either have to uh, try and submit for another grant or we would have to uh, fund it through a regular budget process. Thank you. Any other questions, Council Member Villa Vicencio? No, thank you very much. Okay, Council Member Cave. Um, just a quick comment. I know I could go on forever, but I just think once again, the dedication of the men and women of public safety to Maplewood has been outstanding um, from top to bottom. Just uh, the dedication of them showing up to, to going through all the processes that they, they have needed to, all the changes. Um, change is never easy, and they seem like you know, everything was done effortlessly. And as citizens, we don't always notice everything once again, that goes on in the background. And I'm just thoroughly impressed with everybody on the police and fire and to protect our citizens and businesses and to keep through this pandemic things going. It's just a hats off to everyone on the public safety staff. So I thank you. And I want you to let everyone know how welcome, um, how thankful I am for all of this and all the things in the community that you have still going on. Mac is super essential. The community, you know, coordinator is fabulous and, and uh, just keep going. Great job. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cave. Councilmember Juniman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my only comment really is how phenomenal a group of people is this? It just, you just, even you go through this abbreviated version and it's just, it's mind blowing. It's, it's just phenomenal. I wonder we are on top of the world when, when other people's eyes. And uh, along with the chief, I want to thank you, Mayor, for your involvement with the mental health piece. And um, I want you to know that I've had two people from other places call me and say, how did you manage that? The best answer to that is we're better than you are. But um, I just said, you have to have the right people who want this badly enough. And so hats off to Chief Nadeau and also uh, the fire chiefs and you, Mayor. Thank you so much for this. This is phenomenal. And I just, you go through this and you think, what else could there possibly be? It is, it's wonderful. Thank you, Chief Nadeau and all of the people involved. We are in such good stead in times that could be very, very, very scary. And I think they are much more, um, we are much more at ease because of the kinds of things that go on here all the time. So thanks to everyone. Thank you, Council Member Juniman. Council Member Knudsen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, it's in these tough times, I often get asked the question, is there, are you contemplating defunding the police? My answer is quickly, heck no. <laughs> And then what's good about it, the answer is I'm able to um, go through a litany of things that we're doing in Maplewood. Um, 
you know, talking about uh, mental health and, you know, what, what we learned in a, in a, in a ride along, um, how a social worker can help. So um, again, thanks for all your work and thank you for all your uh, great department. Mary on mute. <laughs> it sounded great. I was calling for a motion to approve the 2020 Community Development Department Annual Report. Is there a motion? So moved. Councilmember moved by Juniman, seconded Second. by Councilmember Cave. Uh, is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's go to a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Thank you, council members. We are going to do a brief little circle back because I did not call for a motion on our uh, to approve the 2020 Community Development Department annual report. That's uh, and we did, isn't it? Pardon me? Isn't that what we just did? Yes, but we did not, I did not call for a motion. We only called for discussion. Hmm. So is there a motion? <laughs> Kathy? I thought, I thought that's the one I heard, just moved. No, that was the police. No, we just did the annual. Safety. Okay. We did public safety. All right. Sorry, I should have made so that more I'm, clear. Now I'm going to, I'll go back with you and we will now <laughs> move for the acceptance of the 2020 Community Development Annual Report. Is there a second? second. Moved by second. Juniman, seconded by Knudsen, the motion to approve the 2020 Community Development Department annual report. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's move to a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. Thank you very much, everyone. Sorry about that. Okay, the last item under appointments and pre presentations is the HPC coordination with St. Paul Regional Water Services Project. Uh, Mr. Sable, do you want to kick that off? And then I understand that Pete Boulay, the chair of the Maplewood Heritage Preservation Commission, is going to be the presenter tonight. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Mike Sable, Assistant City Manager, HR Director. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Belay ran out of time. He had a hard stop at 8.30 and can't do it, but we've been uh, communicating um, behind the scenes and he was comfortable with me sharing kind of the thoughts of the HPC and what they would like to see moving forward. So if it's okay, I'll just do it all. All right, go ahead. Great. Um, the, as you know, the Heritage Preservation uh, Commission um, looks at the historic resources that are uh, in the city of Maplewood. And the St. Paul Regional Water Services is just one of those amenities that has uh, a significant, plays a significant role in the history of Maplewood, um, really serves the region um, as a whole. There's, in fact, there's great videos and storytelling about how uh, this uh, important amenity that is in the in the city of Maplewood, also known as McCarran's Water Treatment Plant. Uh, and um, the St. Paul Regional Water is going to do some upgrades to that service. Um, and the HPC would really like to play a, uh, a more prominent role in the making sure that this uh, project is, is well documented and that historic artifacts are um, uh, maintained and, and preserved where possible. Uh, because this is such a significant project, the State Historic Preservation Office is uh, officially the lead agency with regard to historic preservation. But what um, the HPC would like to do in cooperation with the Ramsey County Historical Society is they are recommending that in coordination that they preserve or reconstruct significant architectural features on the building. Uh, sometimes there are certain plaques or uh, cornerstones or things that are are really important. So they want to preserve or reconstruct those historic significant architectural features. Number two, to preserve any artifacts uh, or historical equipment. Uh, the engineering marvel that was um, uh, 100 years ago was constructed in 1921. Um, you know, some of those things are really important parts of storytelling. 
Uh, and so they would want to preserve his significant historic equipment. Uh, number three, uh, to create uh, on-site interpretive signage that describes the buildings that were uh, potentially altered or changed so that we can do storytelling for future generations. And then lastly, number four, is to prepare some sort of a book or a permanent record to include photos of the demolished buildings, uh, descriptions of the process and why they're important and why they were installed, and document in the, the chronology of the construction and equipment, uh, including detailed drawings. And so there's really, uh, this is a, an ask of the HPC to take a more prominent role in coordinating with the State Historic Preservation Office. And so as the city council uh, is engaged in the approval process, uh, just know that HPC wants to play a, a significant role in preserving this history. And with that, Mayor, I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, I, In looking at our materials for tonight, we don't have any recommended motion. So this is basically just a, a kind of an FYI. Is that the way we're to understand it, Mr. Sable? Uh, Ms., uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members, that's correct. We are, uh, this is our... Um, request of the council to, as items come forward, to include the HPC, and also just to let you know that the HPC is very interested. So this is really uh, almost more like a um, uh, an invitation or a commercial for using the HPC for the skills and the talents that they have, uh, and they want to do some more work, and this is one project where they're very interested. So this was more of an FYI uh, that as plans and specs are developed, as the approval process goes forward, uh, HPC wants to be there every step of the way. Thank you, Mr. Sable. Uh, let's see if there are any questions from council members. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. No, thank you. Councilmember Cave. No, thank you. Councilmember Juniman. No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. No questions. Thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Sable, uh, I am happy uh, to communicate that interest to the water board since I am a sitting member on the water board and we actually have a meeting tomorrow night. Uh, I think what I would do is start with staff. Do you know, has the uh, HPC contacted or communicated with St. Paul Regional Water? Uh, Madam Mayor and Council Members, uh, yes, they have uh, reached out to um, St. Paul Regional Water and State Historic Preservation Office with sort of the request to be involved. But um, I think part of the reason why they had requested a presentation here is um, to seek another champion for you. So if you could bring it up at the meeting, I know that our the commissioners would appreciate it. Certainly, I'd be happy to do that. Um, okay. Uh, thank you for that report. There is no motion on this uh, and so we can move on to the consent agenda. Thank you for that report, Mr. Sable. Uh, council members, is there a motion on the consent agenda? A motion consent agenda items one through nine. Second. Moved by Cave, seconded by Juniman, consent agenda items one through nine. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Moving on, we have no public hearings and no unfinished business tonight. Uh, moving on to new business. Uh, the first item is the resolution uh, regarding uh, the Gladstone House. And Mr. Beatty, you are the presenter for this. Yes, Madam Mayor, Council, thank you. Um, in order to qualify an area as a redevelopment tax increment district, certain statutory tests have to be met, one of which is that at least 50% of the buildings in, within the area are structurally substandard. Uh, in 2018, the city employed a consultant to evaluate the structure on this property, the Gladstone House, and it was found to be structurally substandard. And nothing has changed in the last three years to make it any better. Uh, there are circumstances in which 
buildings are in such poor condition that it is recommended for public safety reasons that they de be demolished. The problem, of course, then is that that removes the uh, building that would qualify an area as a redevelopment uh, area. But the statute anticipates that and allows a city prior to demolition to adopt a resolution determining that the structure is substandard and declaring the jurisdiction's intent to include the property in a redevelopment tax increment district within the next three years. So what you've got before you is a resolution that will accomplish that. In other words, if we adopt the resolution and then demolish the structure, the city would have three years from the date of demolition to create a redevelopment district and still use the, by then, demolished structure to qualify the area. It, um, it's, it's a good thing to do. You don't want to do it any earlier than necessary because it does start that three-year clock. But in staff's opinion, the building is such <clears throat> that it really does pose a safety hazard. And so we recommend that the council adopt the resolution. Thank you, Mr. Beatty, for that presentation. Uh, you know, the Gladstone development area is something that is very important uh, to the future of our city. And I certainly think that this is a, a good way to go. Now, one of the questions that I had was, because I noticed in the report, we all know that tearing down a building uh, costs money. And so I'm going to ask uh, City Manager Coleman, she and I talked about this earlier today, about what are the, the, the estimated costs? What does this look like? Because really, we're taking this action to prepare this uh, area because it is a public safety hazard. Uh, so, uh, but the question, it, our report says, well, the cost is zero. Uh, city Manager Coleman, do you want to explain uh, what the city has done uh, uh, to prepare us for this in terms of the cost to tear down the Gladstone House? Uh, certainly, Mayor, uh, members of the City Council. Um, back, I think it was in late 2018, uh, the City Council actually authorized an inner fund loan to, uh, for $2 million to purchase um, the sites that are in question this evening. Uh, we spent $850,000 on the Moose Lodge and two hundred and seventy-five dollars for the Gladstone House. So we have sufficient funds left to pay for any demolition that will be the demolition costs. We believe that that will be under 100,000, possibly less. We just really don't know until somebody gets in there and starts looking at that. Um, at the time we do that, we will bring those bids back for your consideration uh, for the demolition of those buildings. So that's, we have the funds available. I think why Mr. Beatty did not put a cost in there is because we were not asking permission tonight to spend any money. We were only asking permission to um, authorize, um, to preserve our right to do the TIF district as he just explained. Thank you for that explanation. And I, and I think that gives everyone a little bit better understanding of where we are with it. Also, because the three year timeline start, the clock starts running, what would be the timeline for us to actually see the Gladstone House torn down? Uh, it's my understanding, Mayor, that we're going to move pretty quickly on that to get it done. It is really an eyesore and it's a, it's a public safety hazard. Thank you. I know I've talked to uh, residents and business owners in the Gladstone oh. area, and they will be very appreciative of this. Uh, so let's see if there are any other questions. Uh, Councilmember Villa Vicencio. No questions. Councilmember Cave. No questions. Councilmember Juniman. No questions. This can't happen fast enough. <laughs> Councilmember Knudsen. No questions. Okay, then, Councilmembers, we need a motion. I move the resolution pursuant to Minnesota Statute Section 469.174, Subdivision 10D, regarding 1375 Frost Avenue, a very dilapidated Gladstone House. <laughs> Second. 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 I, I'm not sure who said second first. Doesn't matter. No. Okay. 
Then motion by Juniman, seconded by Cave. The motion uh, to adopt the resolution regarding demolition uh, of the um, substandard building and inclusion of the parcel at 1375 Frost Avenue uh, in a future redevelopment tax increment financing district. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, how do you vote? Councilmember Villa Vicencio? Aye. Councilmember Cave? Aye. Councilmember Juniman? Aye. Councilmember Knudsen? Aye. The motion passes, and I vote aye as well. The motion passes. Uh, moving on to the next properties, very similar uh, uh, circumstance. Uh, Mr. Beatty, do you want to give us the report on this? This is the concerning the former Moose Lodge. My report is ditto. Yes. <laughs> I, I think that's a very sufficient. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think same, that's very sufficient. Yeah, same sort of uh, set of circumstances. Okay. So I move ditto. <laughs> Second. <laughs> okay, so moved by Juniman, sec seconded by Cave, a ditto motion concerning now the former Moose Lodge. Is there any further discussion? I suppose we should say 1946 English Street. Okay, that will be included in the uh, a friendly mm -hmm. amendment there. Councilmember Villa Vicencio, how do you vote? Aye. Councilmember Cave? Aye. Councilmember Juniman? Aye. Councilmember Knudsen? Aye. And I vote aye as well. And I know the neighborhood is going to be thrilled yes. to have both of those properties uh, demolished. And we won't have any more water problems. Remember, we had water problems mm -hmm. at the former Moose Lodge. Uh, uh, in earlier this spring. So this, I think, is a really good uh, move forward in that regard. If there okay. wasn't a pandemic, I suggest there might be a block party in that neighborhood, but there's a pandemic, so they can't. <laughs> That's true. But I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are happy. Uh, okay, moving on to award of bids. Uh, Mr. Love, the first item on the list tonight is the Sterl Sterling Street Bridge Replacement City Project 1625. Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor and Council. So with this project, we are looking at replacing the old uh, wooden bridge on Sterling Street with a new concrete box culvert bridge. I have a map uh, displaying the location here. It's just up on Sterling Street, just a little south of Carver and north of Bailey Road. So at our bid opening, we received four valid bids, which we reviewed and tabulated. Uh, the, the bid prices came in. They ranged from $726,000 to $850,000. And just kind of as a reference, our engineer's estimate was $752,000. The low bidder was, was Northland Grading and Excavating. Uh, staff, along with our consultant, Bolton and Mink, have reviewed uh, the bids as well as their references and our recommending award of bid. Overall, the project uh, overall the project is estimated at nine hundred fifty eight thousand dollars. I just want to make sure that um, everybody understands that includes the construction contract as well as all our indirect costs such as uh, project management, inspection, surveying, and material testing. Uh, the project is funded primarily by municipal state aid funds, as well as state local bridge bond replacement program funds. And as a quick reminder, the city was selected to receive $538,000 in uh, local bridge replacement funds. So that was really good for us. Mm -hmm. If the project is awarded, um, it will begin in June with uh, completion uh, wrapping up in August. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Love. Are there any questions, Councilmember Villa Vicencio? Uh, none at this time. Councilmember Cave? No questions. Councilmember Juniman? No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen? No questions. Okay, and I have none either. Uh, Councilmembers, we have a recommended action. Does someone want to make a motion? I move to approve the resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contract for the Sterling Street Bridge Replacement City Project 16-25 
to Northland Grading and Excavating. Okay. Is there moved by Juniman, seconded by Knutson, the motion to approve the resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contract for the Sterling Street Bridge replacement uh, to Northland Grading and Excavating. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's take a vote. Councilmember Villa Vicencio. Oh, sorry about that. Aye. Councilmember Cave. Aye. Councilmember Juniman. Aye. Councilmember Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. We have one last agenda item. This is a resolution concerning bids and awarding construction contracts for the North Fire Station construction project. Uh, Chief Mondor, this one I believe is yours. Thank you, Mayor Abrams, members of the city council. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Staff requested that the city council adopt a resolution authorizing advertisement for bids at the February 22nd, 2021 city council meeting. Uh, following adoption of that resolution, advertisement for bids were released on March 5th, 2021, and bids were opened on March 23rd, 2021. Construction estimates for this portion of the project were 8.5 million, and the total of the bids came in at uh, just short of 8.3 million. The bids have been verified and tabulated for accuracy and are detailed in your staff report. Uh, the project's construction manager, Carl Sanderson, has provided contract award recommendations, which are also detailed in the report. Um, in the council packet, you'll see that 27 different work scopes were identified and bid. You also see that multiple, multiple bids were received for most of the work scopes. Uh, this is an exciting phase uh, in the, the next piece of the North Fire Station con construction project, and we're requesting a motion to approve the attached resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contracts for the North Fire Station construction project. And with that, I'm available for any questions. Thank you, Chief Mondor. It's getting closer. It's pretty exciting. Uh, Council Member Villavicencio, do you have any questions? None this time. Thank you. Council Member Cave. No questions. Thank you. Council Member Juniman. Just one question on the bid alternates. It says um, replacing overhead steel doors or something of that nature. Does that mean we're going to go to the other kind of door? I hope, I hope. Chief Mondor. Mayor Abrams, uh, Council Member Juniman, the requested amount includes the bid alternates, the bifold doors. Hooray! <laughs> wow. Okay. Thank you for that. Any other questions, Councilmember Juniman? No, thank you. Councilmember Knudsen. Well, just a comment. It seems remarkable during this uh, uh, accelerated construction cost when plywood now is 40 bucks when it used to be 17. Um, that's impressive. So, uh, mm -hmm. just a comment. No questions. Okay. And I have no questions. Uh, so, council members, we have uh, a motion in our packets. Is someone going to make that motion? I move the resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contracts for the North Fire Station construction project. Second. Second. <laughs> Moved by Pinneman, seconded by Knudsen. The motion to approve the attached resolution receiving bids and awarding construction contracts for the North Fire Station construction project. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, then let's move to a vote. Council Member Villa Vicencio. Aye. Council Member Cave. Aye. Council Member Juniman. Aye. Council Member Knudsen. Aye. And I vote aye as well. The motion passes. Council members, we have gone through our entire agenda. It was a very <laughs> full agenda. We got a lot accomplished tonight. Uh, I want to give each one of you an opportunity for any closing remarks that you would like to make. Uh, Council Member Villavicencio. I just wish everybody a peaceful night. Thank you. Thank you for that. Council Member Cave. Um, no comments. Thank you. Council Member Juniman. 
Isn't it a shame that nothing exciting ever happens here? <laughs> mm. <laughs> the nice agenda is like, wow, all right. Um, what I think is exciting about this is that it proves we are always and remain a vital city moving forward as we need to, meeting the needs for now and in the future. It's really exciting. I, I am so glad to be a part of this. Everyone, um, if you can and you haven't yet been vaccinated, please try to. And in the meantime, stay safe because we're not out of the woods yet. And I think we'd all like to be out of the woods. Thank you for those words. Councilmember Knudsen. Well, it's really um, fun and, and enthusiastically um, interviewing those candidates for our commissions. Um, there's some pretty impressive people that step up. It's a hard decision and um, it's an important one. So put some time into it and, and uh, I think we'll have um, even better commissions in the future. Great, thank you for that. Council members, I'll just remind all of you to finish your scoring sheets and get those into uh, City Manager Coleman by the end of the week. And while you're at it, if you are going to be delivering those in person, please bring in your binders. Uh, I'm sure City Clerk Sint will really appreciate that. <laughs> so with that, everyone, I hope you will stay safe. Uh, and uh, good night. Thank you for all the hard work. See you Saturday. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good See night. you Saturday for the cleanup, everybody. Absolutely. Bye.